Harry's Wife, Part 102.45, Cameo Harry. Yo, pretty ladies around the world, I've got a weird thing to show you. So tell all the boys and girls, tell your brother, your sister, and mamma too, because they're about to go down, and you know just what to do. Wave your hands in the air like you don't care. Glide by the people as they start to look and stare. Do your dance, do your dance, quick, mamma. Come on, baby, tell me what's the word, ah, word up. Those of you may recognise that as the 1986 hit Word Up by Cameo, which neatly segues into the topic of Cameo Harry. Yes, Harry. Dear old Prince Harry. Ginger bollocks. The Prince of Pink Pancakes. The Ginger Poodle. Harry and his handler. So many new names for him. He spent his life as the spare. He used to have an excellent relationship with his older brother, William. A strong, loving relationship. Notwithstanding the divorce of their parents and the death of their mother, the two were still bonded, and he was the spare. And he spent his life as the spare, albeit, for a lot of it, a very likeable one. Known as the party prince, a bit of a red-headed rogue uh, that people took a shine to, part because of his natural ability to get along with people, part because people felt sympathy for what he'd had to endure. But the fact was, he was a popular prince. And whilst he was the spare, he still had his place in the sun. However, that position as spare did foster some resentment, which is one of the narcissistic traits that Harry has, and along came a certain somebody who harnessed that resentment, fashioned it, utilised it, and caused him to become all the more resentful for the position that he had adopted, or, more accurately, was given in the royal family. He then wasn't the spare, not in his marriage. He was made numero uno, the grand fromage, the big cheese, Mr. Important, Charlie Big Bananas, possibly Bananas of Empowerment as well. Why? Because he received the golden period from the narcissist. Once she had trained her sights upon him, her narcissism instructed her subconsciously to go hell for leather to embed him, to draw him in, to embed him, motoring him through the position as an intimate partner secondary source, making him the candidate intimate partner secondary source, and then embedding him as the intimate partner primary source, purveyor of all that magnificent fuel, oodles of character traits, and substantial residual benefits, all wrapped up in a tidy package of control. She did this, of course, by flattery, by doling out the spicy poontang, by the presentation of false compassion, by saying to Harry, I understand your loss, by mirroring his deceased mother in mannerism, sense, and dress. All of this was done to create an image that he was the centre of her universe, whilst unwittingly he was being drawn into the orbit around her as the centre of the universe, entirely the way that a narcissist goes about obtaining their prey. He was elevated. He wasn't going to be king unless there was a serious mishap, but he was made to feel like a king as a consequence of her attention, her compliments, her flattery, her soothing words of encouragement and understanding for all of the trials and tribulations that he experienced. He was made to feel so, so special. Perhaps for the first time in his life that he didn't feel that he was playing second fiddle to anybody. He was Prince Harry, still in line to the throne, now he got a wife who was putting out regularly for him and understood him, supported him, and made him feel like king. Life was good. Of course, what he didn't realise was that having been ensnared by a narcissist, he was going to then be met with a sustained devaluation. 
which is what happens to every intimate partner, primary source victim of the narcissist. There are lots of different ways that the sustained devaluation pans out, and you can listen to many of my other videos where I explain how that happens. But for him, part of the sustained devaluation is to, be, is to create Cameo Harry, to reinforce the fact that he is the spare, not just in terms of his relationship with his brother, but actually in terms of his marital relationship, that he isn't the big cheese, she is, that he's not the grand fromage, she is, that he's not Charlie Big Bananas, she's Charlene Big Bananas. How has this occurred? Well, quite simply, it began with the flight across the ocean. Who decided to go? She did. And where did they decide to go? To Canada, because of the contact she had there. And then, as I predicted many, many moons ago, onto California, to be in the state that she had been born in and grown up in, amongst her kind of people. He, relegated to second place, a cameo role already, amongst a culture that was not familiar to him, with people who were not his friends, as he then started to flap and flounder in a sea of unfamiliarity amongst all of these individuals. And thus, his cameo status became cemented. We saw it when he briefly appeared in the Serena Williams podcast, the first one of Arsy Wipes, and he hasn't actually even appeared in any since, despite the suggestion that that would happen. He wandered in, saying, how are you doing? Doing his best Joey impression, one imagines, and then announcing, I like what you've done with your hair. That's a great vibe. Come see us. Thanks for that, cameo Harry. He was caused to pose as a hairdresser on the cover of Time as he was stood behind Harry's wife, relegated to that second position as well, as if he was there saying, mm, suits you, yes, looks absolutely beautiful. The recent One Young World photograph has Harry's wife front and centre with that aggressive pose, Harry off to one side, a cameo in the picture of him and his wife. Most famously, of course, we had him juggling balls on the outside, looking in through the window as his wife engaged in the useless 40 by 40 challenge and made jokes about him with Melissa McCarthy. If ever there were a metaphor for the relationship, it was that. Him on the outside, looking in, playing the clown, juggling his balls, a bit part, in his own home and his marriage. At the One Young World Summit, who strode in lapping up all of the fuel? Harry's wife did. He wandered in alongside her, looking like he wanted to be anybody, anywhere but there. You may recall the time that she pushed in front of him at a function, whereby she elbowed her way in, started talking to the assembled people with her back to him, relegating him to a cameo role. I'll take over from here, darling. Thank you very much. It's now all about me. He, f he created the Invictus Games, something that gave him purpose. Then come The Hague, who hijacked them? Harry's wife did, of course, making them the Harry's Wife Games. He finds himself in a cameo role where he's directed to stand here, say this, move there, grip of doom, holding his hand, be in this place, come this way. And now, all of this and other examples besides create a cameo role for him in his own marriage. It's all about her book, her speeches, her appearances, her fashion, her friend choices, her incessant PR puff pieces. Where are Harry's friends in California? They're through her so that she can control him. Where are his friends from the United Kingdom? He's isolated from them. Harry spent his life as the spare and a likeable one, but he's found himself now becoming the spare in his own marriage. This is indicative of the way that a narcissist treats somebody that they apparently love. He, still, doesn't really see it. There will be moments where he doesn't like the way that he's treated. There will be ways where, moments where he contemplates, this isn't really good what's happening here. But ultimately, 
where he finds himself is that part of his sustained devaluation is that he is Cameo Harry. Second fiddle to her, the afterthought, the bit player. She comes first and he comes second. And that is life with a narcissist. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.